great admirer of your work, uh, really because you have uh, known you to advocate the importance of courage. I was arrested with you at the White House in March of 2011. And uh, my understanding is that Gandhi's example was to plead guilty and uh, advocate suffering in jail to touch the heart of the adversary. I'm unfamiliar with the cop quote, very happy to hear it's better to suffer uh, evil than to do evil. And I'm wondering uh, if you agree with Gandhi or if I misunderstood Gandhi. You know, when, and you're talking about the Veterans for Peace action where 133 of us were arrested and you were there, it was a deeply moving event. Uh, it was snowing heavily. Uh, a watermelon Slim, great blues musician, himself a Vietnam veteran, played taps on his harmonica. They folded the flag of a young kid, the veterans who had been killed in the war in Afghanistan a couple of weeks before. And then everyone fell silent and got on a line and uh, someone slowly beat a drum. You can watch it on YouTube and everybody walked to the fence where we were arrested. And it wasn't covered by the Washington Post, the New York Times, or anyone else, although it was the largest mass arrest in front of the White House since the Vietnam War. But for me, that uh, was a deeply empowering, almost spiritual moment. Um, having come out of war myself, uh, a lot of the veterans and myself who walked uh, to the White House were crying. And um, uh, when I was cuffed and several of my uh, colleagues were cuffed by the Washington DC police, it turns out that um, most of them have been in Iraq and Afghanistan in the National Guard. And when they would cuff us, they would whisper, keep doing what you're doing because these wars stink. It is as Václav Havel wrote in his 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerlessness, The Power of the Powerless, it is essentially our task to keep alive that other narrative. Um, you know, the Occupy encampments were shut down in a concerted effort, a nationally orchestrated effort by Barack Obama. Um, the Occupy activists in the United States have been and are continuing to be severely harassed. Uh, I'm going to a trial <clears throat> on the 30th of this month in New York. Uh, one of the activists was in Zuccotti Park holding a pair of scissors and uh, the police arrested him and charged him with assault against a police officer with a deadly weapon. That's seven years in jail. And when it first came to trial, uh, his lawyer attempted to plea out and the government attorney said there will be no plea because he is on the Department of Homeland Security's terrorism watch list. As I am. Uh, and I know that because when I came back from Italy with a valid US passport, I was uh, taken from customs, this is entering my own country, into a room and held for an hour without explanation until a supervisor came over to the TSA agent behind the computer <clears throat> and said, okay, uh, he's on a watch, tell him he can go. Uh, so uh, I have, as some of you may know, been battling the black bloc anarchists over the issue of violence and uh, debated the black bloc uh, in uh, New York in last September uh, because uh, I think that taunting the police uh, carrying out acts of vandalism or violence uh, is counterproductive to the movement. I think the power of the Occupy movement is that it is a mainstream movement, and that is why the power elite was frightened of it. And you saw that every weekend in Zuccotti Park when mothers would, and fathers would come with their children from New Jersey and push strollers up and down the park. Um, I think that the system internally is so corrupt and so rotten that uh, through nonviolence, we can paralyze the structures within it, the civil service, the police, um, 
you know, the, the Chicago teacher strike was a very good example of what really frightens the police, uh, frightens the state, and that is that when the teachers, in, when they would march, would go into the police precincts to use the bathroom, the police would applaud. And there was a marked difference in uh, the demeanor of the blue uniform cops in Zuccotti uh, when the white shirted uh, officers who all pull about 110,000, 120,000 a year were not around. Most of the real egregious acts of violence were carried out by the, by the white shirted officers. Um, and that's because these people all come out of the working class. Uh, they all have brothers, sisters, father-in-laws, whatever, who you know, don't have a job or had their houses foreclosed. Plus, in New York, they all work as rent cops for $37 an hour in their off time at places like Goldman Sachs. So they watch these guys walk by in their $8,000 suits. You know, they, they get it. And I, and I think part of the reason that uh, the corporate state has been so dogged about keeping the NDAA in place is because they don't finally, they don't finally um, uh, trust the police to protect them. I mean, all revolutionary movements are, uh, whatever the violence is, I mean, most revolutionary movements are actually nonviolent affairs. I mean, the, the, what broke the czar was when the Cossacks were sent into Petrograd to quell the, the bread riots, and instead of quelling the riots, they fraternized with the crowd, and the Tsar had to race back from the front and abdicate in a railway carriage. I covered uh, the revolutions in Eastern Europe. So in East Germany and Leipzig, you started out with these small groups, mostly Lutheran clergy and congregants, holding candlelight vigils in Leipzig, and then suddenly 70,000 people joined them. And what does uh, the communist leader Eric Honecker decide to do, he sends down an elite paratroop division to Leipzig to fire on the crowd. And when they get there, the local Communist Party authorities won't allow them to do it. And, and Honecker lasts another uh, week in power and he's out. Um, I think that, that at this point, the, the discrediting of the 1% is so pervasive um, that that, that this becomes the most effective tactic um, to breaking a rotten, corrupt, and decayed elite. Um, we have to sustain it the way the students did in Montreal, um, the way Idle No More is doing here now. Um, um, the only thing I know for certain is that something will come. Because if the state had responded rationally to what drove people into those encampments, they would have in immediately instituted a massive jobs program, especially targeted people under the age of 25. They would have forgiven all student debt, which is the largest personal debt, over a billion dollars a year. Uh, they would have declared a moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions, and they would have created a rational health care program, Medicare for all. But they didn't. They responded exclusively in the language of force. Um, what will it come? For me, Occupy is a tactic rather than a movement. I mean, Rosa Parks refused to give up that seat on a bus. It was five years later before the Freedom Rides came. But that something is coming, I have no doubt. And right now, and I'm about, not only we'll go to this trial, but then we have a meeting of all of the Occupy leadership on the 2nd in New York. Um, you know, we just have to, we have to keep that flame alive, the way Havel did. I mean, I covered the Velvet Revolution. I spent every night during the Velvet Revolution in the Magic Lantern Theater with Havel and Klaus and Dinsbeer and everybody who would go on to run the government. And that winter, up and down the streets of Prague were posters of the Czech, a Czech uh, university student, uh, Jan Pollack, who to protest the Soviet invasion of uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968 and the overthrowing of Dubček had gone to Wenceslas Square and lit himself on fire. Four days later, he died of his burns. Uh, uh, it was, of course, never covered in the state media. Um, thousands of Charles University students marched with his body to the cemetery. They were broken up by police. When his grave became a shrine, they exhumed his body, cremated his remains, gave his cremated remains to his mother, and told her she couldn't bury them. And two weeks after the communist government fell, 10,000 people gathered in Red Army Square and renamed it Jan Pollock Square. 
I was in Fensala Square when the great Czech singer Marta Kubashova walked out on the balcony. Kubashova had sung the anthem of defiance that was broadcast over the airwaves in 68. And once the Soviet backed regime took power, uh, they destroyed her entire recording stock. They banned her from the airwaves, and she had spent the intervening years working uh, on an assembly line in a toy factory. And I watched her walk out on that balcony and sing that anthem, and every Czech in the crowd knew every word. Acts of resistance are moral acts. You know, I'm very good friends with a great radical priest, Daniel Berrigan, who's 93. I just had dinner with him. And I remember Berrigan, who spent 23 months in federal prison for burning draft records, I remember saying to Dan, you know, if I go to jail just for a day, isn't it, isn't it really just boutique activism? Um, <laughs> Uh, and he has this kind of, you know, wan smile. Uh, and he said, you know, you never know who comes to that event and is changed. And then he said, look, we have to give up this, the highs and lows of sort of uh, the, the modern emotional life. That we have to understand that we're called to do the good, or at least the good insofar as we can determine it and then we have to let it go. That the Buddhists call it karma, but the act of faith is the belief, even though all the evidence around you may point otherwise, the belief that the good draws to it the good. That the good goes somewhere. Uh, and I think that's right. And I think that is the point that we're in. Anybody who uh, is reading climate science reports, um, a government, US government commission just published one, the World Bank did, I mean, it's terrifying. It is terrifying. And, you know, we face, you know, as Camus laid out in the myth of Sisyphus, this awful reality that there's probably, at this point, very little we can do. And yet, resistance is a moral imperative. And even if everything around us at the end of our lives is worse, that does not invalidate what we have done. Uh, and I think that, you know, as Havel said, it is that capacity to live in truth. Um, that it, and it, 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 especially if you are among the oppressed, it makes a kind of leap of faith. And yet, there are these moments, and Gandhi's life illustrates it, I think Havel's life, certainly as a dissident, illustrated it, where that dogged persistence of nonviolence, of constant resistance, of a refusal to be complicit, has a capacity to unmask and ultimately disempower a system. And, and I think that that certainly is what, at this point, we're called to do. Well. Capitalism will kill us. Uh, capitalism is killing us. And capitalism at its core is a morally reprehensible ideology. Uh, it, is, it defines itself solely, primarily by what it's against. Because when you examine what it is, uh, it is about human greed, human manipulation. You have a business school here? I don't think any university should have a business school. Uh, what do they teach? Laissez-faire capitalism? Well, we, that's not what we have. We have the corporate welfare state. Uh, they, you know, the federal government lends Goldman Sachs money at 0% interest along with the banks. And then we who have credit cards pay 15 to 30 percent interest. Well, that's not capitalism. I think it's theft. I don't know what it is. Um, uh, uh, you know, you can't sort of lose in that kind of system. Um, yeah, capitalism is, a, is, is literally is what's destroying us. And, and it's interesting that if you uh, look at Marx's notebooks, 
which I got. They're, very, they're not easy to get. I had to get it out of the rare book room of the Princeton University Library. But the, it's all studies of indigenous culture. The Iroquois, how they're governed, communal meals, what their rituals are. Uh, and, and when you look at westward expansion, it was about destroying that competing ethic. And if we don't recover that ethic, then capitalism will destroy us. Because some sort of a popular movement seems like pretty much the only way that we're going to steer away from the abyss that we're, we're racing toward, uh, there's a huge effort to make it as unattractive as possible to be an activist. But I, I'm sure you're aware recently uh, Freedom of Information Request uh, documents released show that the FBI considered uh, Occupy a potential terrorist threat and was coordinating with banks and private right. security firms before the first tent went up. Uh, here in Canada we had uh, a conviction of a, a G20 protester just recently. The, the judge used the term fascism in their statement, but there was still a conviction. Uh, in that sort of environment, how do we, if you have any idea for strategies to encourage people to be as safe as possible when they protest, but more importantly to feel as safe as possible, because as long as the image in everybody's head is, I'm going to go to protest and then the police are going to beat me, we might as well be putting up advertising posters you know, looking for masochists to get people to come out of the protest. Right, well, the, I mean, that's what the state wants. I mean, part of the reason they re that FOIA request was probably granted uh, is because they wanted all the activists around the country or people who are considering being activists to understand that we're going to mess with your life. And fear becomes the... But Havel addresses this, you know, I mean, that, you know, it's, it's when you overcome that fear uh, that you be begin to have an effect. They want to make us afraid. I mean, that is clearly the goal. Uh, and we're just going to have to find the courage not to be afraid. Uh, if anything's going to happen. Uh, and, and the only way to do that is, um, is to build communities of resistance that are willing to take on these forces together. Um, but look, you know, going to jail is more time than I care to donate to the U.S. government. Uh, and yet, I think it's the only mechanism that we have left. I'm about to go up and get arrested outside Hancock Air Base where the drone attacks are with Veterans for Peace. Um, but there's also a kind of freedom in it. I mean, there's a kind of freedom in it. And, you know, uh, but, but uh, you know, they're not, especially if they feel threatened, yeah, they're not going to make it easy for us. But they want us to be afraid. That's the goal. Well, in this sense, America is different from Canada, in that American culture is deeply violent. Since the Newtown massacre, where the 20 school children were killed, and I think it was six adults were murdered, there have been 588 homicides in the United States, including a school shooting today, by the way. What is the reaction of the shooting? You, you go into a gun shop anywhere in the country and the shelves have been stripped because Americans are terrified there's going to be gun control. So they're buying up as many automatic assault rifles as they can. Um, we are a culture that has a long history of violence. Uh, as writers like Ishmael Reed and Michael Moore and others have pointed out, what drives the gun culture in the United States is white supremacy and a fear of black people. And um, uh, it's not coincidental that the mother of the shooter in Newtown was into this kind of survivalist uh, ideology. Uh, and so I think it's going to be very hard to push through gun control. We have very powerful movements in the United States that are proto-fascist. 
the Christian right, the Tea Party, the lunatic fringe of the Republican parties, militias. These are people who fuse the language and iconography of nationalism with religion. They speak in the language of violence, they celebrate the gun culture, and they do what fascist movements always do, which is direct a legitimate rage and sense of betrayal towards the vulnerable. Muslims, undocumented workers, homosexuals, intellectuals, liberals, feminists, they have a long list of people they hate. Uh, and our backlash, because we have destroyed our populist and radical movements, and because there is such severe repression against the Occupy movement, which is a nonviolent movement, means that you know, this response may find its expression through these very terrifying forces uh, that exist within American society. I don't think that that can be unfortunately discounted. I have this I have this theory that in order to over in over in order to overcome a fear, you must face it head on and act in the face of that fear. And in order to think beyond your own death, you have to face your own death. I was wondering if you could extrapolate or what your thoughts were on that. Well, you know, I was a war correspondent for a long time. And what happens when you cover conflict? is that your perimeter of fear shrinks. So, um, I mean, for example, I was in Basra during the Shiite uprising in 1991 until I was captured and taken prisoner by the Iraqi Republican Guard. I like to say I was embedded with the Iraqi Republican Guard. <laughs> and about 20 miles north of Basra, we were ambushed. Uh, we were going through a mud-walled village and uh, Shiite rebels opened fire on the convoy and uh, everybody dove out of the vehicles. It was raining, crawling through the mud and I crawled into a ditch and, you know, I cover, had covered the war for five years in Salvador. I mean, I'm sort of conditioned and I looked up behind me to see if there were bullets going into the wall because that would be the only indication that there was fire being directed towards me and there were not. And I remember thinking, you know, you should try and be afraid. <laughs> um, that said, when that perimeter is broken, when you actually think you're gonna die, it's terrifying. And I don't wanna pretend that it isn't. Um, and I, I write about it and, you know, with great embarrassment, but it happens to be true that I have sat huddled in moments, I mean, where people are being shot you know, a few feet away from me. And, and, you know, I speak as somebody graduated from Harvard Divinity School. I mean, it's completely childish, but it's, and I'll pray, God, if you get me out of here, I'll never do this again. <laughs> <laughs> so much for Karl Barth. Um, uh, so, look, I mean, I don't want to minimize the confrontation with your own mortality. It's scary. I mean, it's terrifying. And yet, the more that we're able to step out of the boundaries that they impose on us, the less fear we have. And, um... Is it safe to say that the fear they impose on us is the boundaries we create for ourselves? Well, you know, what's the great line, I forget who said it, that, you know, ask, uh, maybe it's Frederick Douglass, I don't remember, but it, <clears throat> you know, that uh, find out how much people are willing to tolerate and you find out how much oppression, you know, they will give you. Uh, I mean, we in America, despite, you know, our myth of ourselves, are absolutely supine. Um, I've lived in France. I mean, my son just graduated from a university in the States where by the time you add it all together, it's $52,000 a year. And I told him, look, you know, if somebody in France got up and told French university students that they had to pay $52,000 a year to go to college, they'd shut the damn country down. Um, uh, they're going to keep doing it as long as you allow them. And, uh, and in fact, when, you know, 
having been at the New York Times, I've been inside the corridors of power. And the one thing I know for certain is the Occupy movement scared the shit out of them. And that's why they shut it down. They know how corrupt it is, even more than we do. And I, you know, I went to school with some of these guys on Wall Street. Uh, and they're very cynical. They're just grabbing as much personally for themselves as they can get on the way out. Um, and when you have a power elite that is essentially understands that level of corruption, um, they become very vulnerable. So uh, I, I don't want to minimize the security and surveillance state, which is nasty. And you know, this friend of mine who's facing seven years in prison is pretty frightened of facing, as he should be, seven years in prison. Uh, and they went after him because he was one of the, he was there the first day. And he, they, they, they infiltrated and they knew who the figures were and they're going for him. You know, we could always tell who the cops were in Zuccotti because they'd show up with baseball caps on and tell us they went to some college but they forgot their ID. But what the tip off was, they were always saying, they were always coming up and saying, so, uh, who do you think the leaders are here? <laughs> So one of these cops went up to a woman in the medical tent and goes, uh, so who, who do you think likes in charge here? And she goes, I am. <laughs> he goes, really? Well, what are you in charge of? And she goes, I'm in charge of everything. <laughs> he goes, wow, well, what's your title? She goes, God. We, can't beat, we cannot beat the security and surveillance state at their own game, which is why we have to be utterly transparent. Uh, you know, and this is part of my problem with the black bloc. I mean, look at Oakland. They tried to keep it all secret. They wanted to take over that building. Well, the only people who knew they were taking it over were you know, the small cobble of black bloc organizers and the cops. We can't win that game. We've got to be complete. That's why the, I love the General Assembly, because you know, the, the, the cops just could stand there, everything was open. That's the, that, that is the only way to fight back, utter transparency and nonviolence. You know, I had a really interesting moment a couple months ago. I gave a talk in New York, and there was a YouTube clip of me where I was speaking in Zuccotti, and I was telling people not to insult the blue uniform police, no matter what they do. And then I said in the YouTube clip, you know, these blue uniform police have to live with these white shirted assholes every day. We only have to see them, you know. So at the end of my talk, some guy comes up to me and he goes, I read all your books and I'm a white shirted asshole. <laughs> and it was a really good lesson to me, not even to insult the white shirts. No, really. And it was a really good reminder that even within that elite power structure, don't shut those people off, you know. That, that in, the fact is we have truth on our side. You know, we have uh, justice on our side. And they don't. And they know it. And when you are able to mobilize people and build that kind of consciousness, as I saw in Eastern Europe, I mean, the Stasi state, until the United States, was the most sophisticated security and surveillance state in the world. And they fell. And I think that if we can begin to sustain a movement, and I think Canada's done a good job of sustaining movements, you know, the most important activism right now in the United States is centered around the Keystone XL pipeline in Texas. Um, that is a transnational, you know, we need you as much as you need us. And I'm gonna go out to Houston in a couple weeks um, there's no question in my mind that Obama will approve the northern leg. Uh, and the only thing we have left, you know, and we're literally now talking about saving, saving the planet for our kids. Um, you know, the only thing we have left is our bodies. But if we'll use them uh, the way they are in Texas at this moment, uh, you know, and we get enough of us and we keep doing it, uh, there's a lot more of us in the end than there is of them. Should we do one more question? Um, during the presentation, I heard that you had some um, thoughts about, well, you had adverse thoughts about what was termed natural law. I would like to oh my gosh. understand what was the 
what, what's your interpretation of natural law? And um, yeah, how did you apply it there? <laughs> because first of all, you said that there, uh, if you're in line with truth and that which is good, you shall progress, right? If, if something is rooted in, in nature, the actual, the actual laws that govern behavioral consequence, would that not be the truth and good and it's not a figment of man's imagination? What are you, philosophy major here? I'm just a, <laughs> I'm just a poor divinity student. Um, because also, like, um, well, I'd have to get more of a, an understanding of what your definition of natural law would be. Well, um, I use the term natural law as people saw capitalism as a kind of natural law. So I was, I was using natural law as, I was using the notion that unfettered capitalism is, you know, a kind of natural state as a critique of capitalism. I wasn't actually talking about natural law. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm really qualified to get up and start giving a, I'll just embarrass myself, giving a discourse on natural law. Um, you know, I, I am a believer that you know, that oftentimes, and especially coming out of war, people can embrace forces. I mean, Freud writes about this in Civilization and its Discontents, that, and, and I mean, Freud's argument, in essence, is that, you know, the two most powerful forces within human life are eros, that capacity to nurture, preserve, and protect, and thanatos, or the death instinct. And certainly having been in situations of war, I have watched as people are as attracted to forces of death, seduced by forces of death, as they are to forces of life. Even though there comes a certain moment, this was certainly true in, in the war in Bosnia, where you recognize that that attraction to those forces of death will kill you. Um, and I think that um, what the moment that we face now in human history is one where we have been utterly seduced by the forces of death. You know, the, 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 the physical decay, you see it in the streets of this city. <coughs> the degradation of the environment, I mean, it's all apparent around us. And yet, the attraction of the system, even though it's a system of death, is so enticing that we can't fight it. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I guess the short answer is that, you know, having covered conflicts I've watched human societies engage in behavior that is utterly suicidal and irrational and yet um, intoxicating. And I think that that describes largely what's happened within the capitalist system itself. It doesn't matter, we are so hooked into the system that we're willing, in essence, to commit collective suicide rather than confront a very painful reality. Uh, and respond to save ourselves, to save the ecosystem, and to save you know, the planet for future generations. Thank you.